Welcome everybody. And I am so happy to welcome all of you to part two of our Jewish history series as we look at the foundations of our identity in this beautiful picture that Nachli Al Salavan, the museum guy, is putting up for our first screen. You can see that we are going to be focusing on Mesopotamia today. And without any further to do, it is my pleasure to welcome all of you here for the second of our three part series. And I would like to kindly hand over to Nachli Al Salavan, our tour guide for today. Thank you very much, Rabbi, and welcome everyone. Um, I'm just making sure that sound is working, everyone can hear me. Um, as a school teacher, when we started teaching on Zoom, I had this amazing experience of being able to mute 25 10th grade girls all at once. It's really an empowering feeling. And then you walk back into the classroom and you go, why can't I just mute everyone? So anyway, it's wonderful to be here. Um, our focus today is on Mesopotamia, and we're going to go there, we're going to see the sites, but what I'd like to do is give an overview of Mesopotamia, what it is, why it's important to us in terms of our Jewish identity, and then finally to go to the actual places, not all of them, we don't have the time to go to most places that we're going to mention, but we're going to go to Assyria and Babylon's ancient ruins, and then we're going to be visiting um, three different museums in order to focus on uh, three different areas of Mesopotamia. So this is really, really exciting. So I'm going to begin with uh, an overview of when I say Mesopotamia, what am I referring to? So first of all, uh, last week we spoke about Egypt and uh, that is on the bottom left here. Egypt is the land of the Nile. When we say Mesopotamia, we are referring to the land between the rivers, which are highlighted here in green and blue. Uh, green is the Tigris River. In the Torah, it's called the Chidekel. And the blue is the Prat. In the Torah, it's called the Euphrates. The Greeks refer to this land as the land between the rivers. It's visually clear why it's called that when you see it on the map, because it's the strip of land between the two rivers. And one of the uh, two of the four rivers mentioned in the beginning of Genesis, which uh, re are referred to as basically the foundation of human development, of uh, the first cities, the beginning of civilization, 70 nations, languages. It all starts here in the area which we call the cradle of civilization, or if you want to refer to Egypt as well, the Fertile Crescent. And I'm going to share with you some very uh, fun um, details some uh, nuggets, if you will, about that term and where it originated. We're going to actually see something really cool today. So when we talk about Mesopotamia in terms of our foundation, in terms of our identity, it's important to mention some of the important sites, especially as we go through the parasha. I mean, we just uh, we just read Chaye Sarah, which has to do with the land of Canaan, but if we go earlier, in terms of our origins, our origin story actually begins in Iraq of today. So just as an overview, before going into details, when we talk about Mesopotamia, uh, Avraham, Abraham is uh, from Ur of the Chaldeans, or Kasdim. There are two possibilities as to where to place Ur. I'm not going to get into the full discussion about that, but I will mention both of them. One of them is here in Ur, and we're going to visit Ur soon. Um, Ur used to be, we're talking 4,000 years ago, Abraham is dated to 3,800 years ago, so the ziggurats of Ur is earlier than that, um, was actually on the what's called the Persian Gulf today. The water actually receded, and we have ev geologic evidence of this. So when we talk about the great ziggurats, the, the pyramids of Ur, the city of Ur, which was the capital of the Sumerian Empire, uh, arguably one of the first larger precursors to empire. Um, it was on the banks of the river. That's going to be important soon. We're going to talk about that a little bit later. Uh, Persia is uh, here in purple, 
The reason I made it in purple, I thought it would be funny, is because purple is the color of grapes and wine. And Persia is the last book in Tanakh. It's about the story of the Persian Empire, Shushan, Queen Esther, Achashverosh, Mordechai, Purim. That's here. That's a Shushan, uh, Shushan Habira. This is Susa, which is in the area of Mesopotamia. It's not in the Fertile Crest. It's not between the rivers. Um, Babylon. Of course, Babylon is very important for us in terms of the story of the Tower of Babylon. Um, there is a legend that we have, there's a medrash that we have, a tradition that Abraham uh, argued with the king of Babylon. I'm not getting into all that stuff, but Babylon is very important. It shows up in Genesis. It shows up again after the destruction of the first temple. Uh, the Jewish community continued in Babylon for thousands of years. We're talking about uh, the uh, Babylonian Talmud as part of Jewish curriculum around the world today. So Babylonia has a very... Uh, important place in Jewish history, especially like Baghdadi Jews, Iraqi Jews, right? So that's uh, Babylon and Assyria. Assyria, we're going to focus a little bit more on Assyria because it's usually lesser known. Like people hear about Babylon and they can conjure up at least an idea, an association, like the Hanging Gardens of Babylon, one of the seven wonders of the world, or the Ishtar Gate, or Nebuchadnezzar, you know. But what do we know about Assyria? And I think Assyria is one of the most fascinating of them. So we're going to visit it soon, and we're going to see what we found there in the museum. But this is Assyria. Assyria is on the Euphrates, while uh, Babylon is on, uh, sorry, Assyria is on the Tigris, while Babylon is on the Euphrates. I'll zoom out so you can see that, right? And finally, I, mean, if I, I can quote the Monty Python, you know, what is the capital of Assyria in the Holy Grail? So the capital of Assyria, that's, we're going to visit it. And one more little point, which is kind of fun. Uh, we don't have time to get into it, but the other option as to where or where there are Jewish and also Muslim traditions, interestingly enough, that are here in Turkey, uh, near the city of Orfa. Um, for those of you who are more into uh, spices and cooking, there's Orfa uh, paprika. I have a neighbor who is into all this stuff. She gets Aleppo paprika, Orfa paprika, like she's into like so many different types of paprika as a gourmet chef uh, where I grew up in the old city. So she talks about that. But Orfa, like there's a Jewish family, Orfali, um, that sounds like or, and there's a conversation about why this or, not that or, not getting into it again. But Haran is where Abraham actually uh, has that vision about going into Israel and is told, go forth, lech lecha. So he leaves Haran and he goes uh, up the Fertile Crescent and then down into Canaan. So in a nutshell, um, we've seen some important cities that are relevant to our identity, and they're all happening here in the Fertile Crescent. Okay, now let's take that further. So Mesopotamia. Our first stop is going to have to do with the city of Ur. I mentioned the Great Pyramids of Ur. The city of Ur uh, went through a few iterations until it became the capital of the Sumerian Empire. But the city of Ur, the reason it's so important is because of its location. As we know in real estate, location, location, location. The location of Ur, let's actually see it. Uh, the location of Ur is what used to be, of course, on the Persian Gulf. Now, the reason that's important is because Ur is at the key point that connects between uh, the rivers of Mesopotamia, it's at the very bottom of it, and with the Persian Gulf, with the ocean. So they're basically the meeting point between the maritime trade that's coming from the east all the way from China, India and China, and Arabia, and they're also connecting uh, the Fertile Crescent. They're connecting to Mesopotamia, down to Canaan, down to Egypt. So they're at that point where all of the trade routes, the land trade and the water trade, the maritime trade, are meeting. The first cities in history, are, and, es and especially the empires, known as the river empires, are sitting on water. And the reason that's important is because he who controls the water Controls the controls the commerce, not only the commerce, but if you're talking about sweet waters like the Euphrates and the Tigris, or like uh, the Nile in Egypt, you are in control of agriculture. You can produce plenty, 
and you can build up your economy and your society. And then you can accommodate all this traffic going through you, et cetera, et cetera. So when we think ancient empires, they're called the river empires, Egypt, Babylon, Assyria, even Persia, arguably, because they controlled the Persian Gulf. Um, so that's that's very important to talk about their location and why it's important that they are on the rivers and why the story in Genesis, of course, in Bereshit, uh, sort of gives you this expose of how creation is built, how, how civilization develops, that is. It's all about the four rivers, two are rivers of Mesopotamia and the two other rivers are the tributaries of the Nile, known as the White and Blue Nile, to put a long story short. Okay, so let's talk about Ur. So the ziggurat, uh, we sort of saw it, where it is. There's not much to see there today. If I were to, if I were to just zoom in, sorry, there we go. Here's the ziggurat. I got ahead of myself with the picture. If you look carefully, you can see the traces of uh, archaeological excavations. They get covered over with dust. In ancient times, there were flash floods before there were dams that control the, the flow of the water. So this is an area that's very prone to floods. If you want to talk about the story of the flood, there are several different variations of that story in ancient extra-biblical sources, uh, Babylonian, um, Assyrian, etc. And that's because you're living in an area where the floods can wash out civilization. So we're looking at, at excavations. We're going to see what was found here. But what's fascinating is that the James Woolley, uh, it's a great name. You'd think Woolley excavated the Woolley Mammoth. But no, he excavated here in the heat of Mesopotamia. Um, he excavated here and found this, uh, this ziggurat, which ziggurat simply means stairway to heaven. Um, this is, of course, it's been through some significant restoration, but it was pretty much intact. It's this massive pyramid. Here's the picture of a reconstruction, including the palace on top, the temple on top, which is reconstructed based on estimation and sources and pictures. But the point is that this is a very sophisticated society and civilization. They are very wealthy and uh, they control the ancient trade routes. They're the capital of the Sumerian empire. We're talking about 4,000. 4,300 years ago. When Abraham comes onto the scene, he's already into, well into a, an established uh, economy, uh, politics, society, religion, social structures, and all of that. Okay, So that's really important. Now, what I'd like to do from here is to actually take us to a museum that shows us a little bit more about the generally uh, the Fertile Crescent and Mesopotamia and a few things about Ur. So without further ado, I'm going to take us to our next visit. Look out for the jump. We are going to the Midwest. Welcome to Chicago, the University of Chicago, more accurately. And we are looking at the Oriental Institute Museum. Now, the Oriental Institute Museum of Chicago has a really interesting story uh, that has to do specifically with Mesopotamia and the Fertile Crescent. Uh, the museum was founded by James Henry Breasted, who was a legend in and of himself, but he was an, ar an American archaeologist um, in the early 1900s who had the conviction that if you want to study ancient biblical history, you have to look at the, at, at the Old Testament, at the Hebrew Bible, at the Tanakh, even though he's a Christian. And the reason he said that is because the Tanakh, the Hebrew Bible in its essence is of the ancient Near East. And therefore you have to leave out what Christians consider biblical, which is Greece and Rome. If you go to the British Museum, those, uh, there's little booklets, you know, travel, uh, explore the British Museum with the Bible. And a Jew opens and says, I don't understand what Herod the Great has anything to do with the Bible. But if you're a Christian, that makes sense, right? Because Herod the Great. You know? But to Jews, it's like, but that's post-biblical. So what he did is he built a museum. Let's jump into the entry, uh, the introductory gallery. He built a museum that says it focuses on the cradle of civilization, on uh, Mesopotamia, or Assyria, Babylon, the Hittites, the Persians, all that stuff, the land of Canaan, Egypt, and that's it. We don't go beyond that. You can even see uh, here, there's a beautiful timeline at the entrance. We're going to zoom in. 
Uh, here's a timeline of events in world history with artifacts in the museum that you can then explore. They have Mesopotamia, Anatolia, which is Turkey, uh, the Hittites, uh, Levant or Megiddo, they excavated in Megiddo. Uh, there's a fun story to talk about. I, I don't have time to get into it, but I'm so, okay, I'm tempted. One thing, okay, um, you've definitely heard of a General Edmund Allenby uh, who, who defeated the Persian Empire in World War I in Israel. The pivotal battle in which he defeated the Ottoman Empire is in the Battle of Megiddo, where they excavated, right? The, he, this museum excavated there. Now, the story goes that he, he actually repeated the first recorded battle in human history, which is the Battle of Megiddo, right? Uh, which happened with King Tutmos III. He's the, the stepson of uh, Queen Hatshepsut, Pharaoh Hatshepsut of Egypt, the Queen Pharaoh, very famous. And um, and he basically repeated the same tactic. I'm not going to get into the details, but he actually is recorded to have met James Henry Breasted in Cairo. And he said to him, you know, I took a leaf from your book about ancient history because James Henry Breasted was the only printed book at the time of uh, world, at post-World War I that was available to uh, General Allenby, um, which he, he would have read. There's no other book on the topic in, like the hieroglyphics were just recently deciphered. There are only two books on the topic at the time, and this was the only one available to him. So it's a great story where he says, I took a leaf from your book, basically. And he was actually called Sir Allenby of Megiddo. So that's a great story. And Egypt, Nubia, which is today Sudan and Persia. So you kind of get the idea. Now, here's the surprise. The person who coined the term, the Fertile Crescent, is James Henry Breston. He's the one who coined the term. That's kind of cool when we're, we're in a museum that focuses on the Fertile Crescent as the cradle of civilization. He called it the Fertile Crescent. That's kind of cool. Okay, so let's speak a little bit about the Fertile Crescent. Um, we're going to just skip over a few exhibitions here of things that are found in general areas of the Fertile Crescent. Uh, but I want to focus on some important inventions that happened here and why it's called the Cradle of Civilization. So um, let's skip ahead for a moment. I'm skipping empire. I'm skipping a lot of stuff. Uh, we have the development of writing. So this is just a collection of different types of writing in ancient Sumerian and Akkadian. But the first writing in human history, you can see there's charts here about different kinds of writing and pictographs, as they're called. They started here in the Fertile Crescent. This is where writing was invented. It's before hieroglyphics. It's before the Chinese, um, even though some of those are very old. So these exhibits here show you various different types of writing, um, envelopes encased in carbon copies of the original document. Like you can kind of see it here. Um, I'm gonna, I'm gonna annotate this so you see it. This is an envelope, which is hollow on the inside, and it contains this letter. So this is, in essence, the first carbon copy, where you'd have a copy for the merchant, a copy for uh, for the recipient, and you basically have a, a, a notarized uh, writing, a documentation of trading in commodities. It's the necessity, which is the mother of invention, as we say. The necessity here being keeping track of commodities in an economic uh, center. So we need to keep track of these things. Writing was of course, it didn't start with writing. It started with tokens, and then they were drawn, drew pictures of the tokens, and then the letters. It's a, it's a, it's a development, but it's a development that came as a need, as a, an answer to the need created by civilization's development in this area where there was massive trade happening because of the trade routes. Right? So that connects us to the concept of um, the Fertile Crescent uh, and and water. And this part over here is really interesting. Uh, these little uh, pieces of stone are called uh, cylinders. We're going to see them when we in, in two weeks in the Met, even though the ancient or eastern galleries, that's a picture in my background, that's from the Met, it's currently under renovation, so we won't be able to go there, but we will see some of these things in Egypt. But these are called cylinder seals. Cylinder seals, uh, the next display actually shows you how they were made, so let's skip through this. Um, this is a picture from Egypt showing you, for, it's a picture from an Egyptian cave painting, showing you how an Egyptian craftsman 
is using sort of like a spindle, but he's using it to make holes and to pull it and to drill holes into these pieces of stone. Sometimes they were precious stone. And sometimes they were actually covered with gold, like this picture here. And it shows you right here how there's a piece of, of blue stone, which is very precious, lapis lazuli it's called, with gold on top and the bottom, and there's a thread through it. And then it was worn by women, in this case, Sumerian, uh, as like a pin holding their garment together in different ways. In some cases, it was used as a ring and sometimes a necklace, sometimes a bracelet. But the point is we've developed writing. We've developed a need for, for signatures when most people are illiterate, right? Um, so you just have your signature and you just sign something, which is really neat because that develops the need for a unique identification. So there's, there's whole conversations about identity and cylinder seals, my name, my signature, and different ways to guarantee things. It's really cool. So this is just a little bit um, about some of the important developments which began here in Mesopotamia and have an impact for thousands of years on things that we use until today, writing, documentation, signatures, alphabet, that all started here. And the terrain is what helps us understand why it's here that it evolved. Okay, so we saw a little bit about Mesopotamia. I'm gonna jump to another interesting room here in the Oriental Institute. So the Oriental Institute, as I mentioned, focuses also on Assyria and Babylon. These lions, which we're gonna end our tour with, a bunch of them, uh, there's one of these in the, in the ROM, in the Royal Ontario Museum on the fifth floor when you walk up on the right. Uh, that one in the Ram is from the throne room of King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon. These ones are from the procession way leading up to the gate that he built. It's a little bit different. It's kind of cool. I'm not going to go to the Ram today, too much jumping around, but uh, these are the lines of Babylon. And in front of us is a striding winged bull with a human head from the palace of Sargon, who is Assyrian. Sargon is the father of, uh, of um, Sennacherib, Sennacherib who, who attacked uh, King Hezekiah. That's another story. We're going to talk about Assyria, but this is Assyria and this is Babylon. And that's all I wanted to say. Uh, we're going to segue from this introduction to Assyria and Babylon to talk about the first of our two stops, next two stops, and that is, um, as, that is Assyria. So hold on to your virtual seatbelts. We are making a leap towards Assyria. Assyria was uh, recently, when I say recently, within 20 years or even 10 years, was on the news because of unfortunate activity by uh, ISIS, who was very active in the city of Mosul. This is the city of Mosul, and right ne within its uh, borders on the, rigor on the Tigris River is this, this lighter area, which is higher up. It's the archaeological site. It's a tell. It's a little mound where we found the ruins of the city of Nineveh. So if you have come to cross the Bridge of Death and have to answer the question, what is the capital of Assyria? The answer is Nineveh. Nineveh. We know about Nineveh from the story of Jonah and the fish. Jonah is supposed to go to Nineveh. He goes the other way, ends up having to go back to Assyria, so doubled his travel distance. Um, this is Nineveh. Now, the reason Nineveh is so important to us is because the excavation in Nineveh in um, 1848 is uh, the same year as the Communist Manifesto. That's why it's easier to remember if you're history buffs, 1848. It's the first bona fide biblical archaeological excavation and discovery. I'll, I'll say that again in other words. The first excavation, which uh, reflected a real biblical story, is here in Nineveh. For the first time, British and American archaeologists discovered a palace which having learned how to read the cuneiform they read is built by none other than King Sennacherib 
and he decorates his throne room with a story of the conquest of the city of Lachish, and he talks about Jerusalem and King Hezekiah. That's all found here on the ruins of a palace of an Assyrian king. This is where biblical archaeology was born. And after here, it becomes a rat race between the different empires uh, before the fall of the Ottoman Empire. We're talking late 1800s, uh, are looking in mid, late 1800s, rushing all over to find the Bible, to dig up the Bible. So this is where it started. That's why it's so cool. So this is, uh, this is the place. I'm going to zoom out. So you see that below here is the place called Nabi Yunus. Now, it's been photographed already after the destruction. So you're seeing here just a hole in the ground. But this location was a mosque uh, in the location where some traditions have it that the prophet Jonah, which is Yunus, was buried. So this was already blown up by ISIS and destroyed. Excavations have found remnants of ancient Assyrian palaces underneath that. But this was the capital of the Assyrian Empire uh, several times in history. You know, capitals kind of move around a little bit. Now, I'm going to take us from here to the main place where the excavations uh, are displayed, what we found. So hold on to your seatbelts again. We're going to go back to Europe. London, here we come. That's just a picture. Here we go. The British Museum. The British Museum um, is an, a magnificent uh, building, which uh, I'm going to mention it now because we're going to be talking next week about Greece. And we're going to actually meet in the Met in a couple of weeks. And we're going to visit the Greek galleries. And what's important for our story is that the similarity between a public cultural building and the Greek empire becomes apparent when you see it, right? This looks very familiar, doesn't it? And it looks like the Parthenon. And in fact, that's exactly what it's supposed to be. And there are parts of the Parthenon inside it without getting into the politics about who wants what back, who stole it, who took it, who had rights. Not getting into that, but um, the the image on the top here is basically copying the images of the different gods on top of the Parthenon in, in Athens, which we're going to visit virtually next week, but it just changes it a little bit to reflect what the message of this museum is. So it's really cool. Like when you want to talk about the impact of the West, of, of Greece on the West, that's, that's Greece. That's such a Hanukkah conversation, and I hope to just whet your appetite for next week, but let's jump into the Assyrian galleries. Okay, we are on the first floor of the museum, and I'm just giving you a glance, an overview. We can spend easily just virtually an hour here. I'm going to point out a few things. Number one, um, the Assyrian kings, the Assyrian empire, roughly 2,800, 2,750 years ago, uh, they were a very powerful empire, and we're going to see some examples of that that prove that. They took the world to a new stage. The Assyrian Empire began as a kingdom called Ashur, Assyria, just like Babylon and Egypt. They're all kingdoms. But they restructured their government to, have a, to include within it other kingdoms, of course, by conquering them and subjugating them, obviously, and turning them into vassal kingdoms. These were the first ones to do that. Egypt never did that in the sense of an administration that has a king on top of other kings. It's more like you exert power over other kings and force them to do your will, and your will or you have your local governors there. It's, it's a different way of structuring government. And the reason that's important is because in world history, Assyria is considered to be the first real empire. It has to do with administration, tax collection, expansion, army. It's a lot of different parts. But that's for if we were to do a whole tour just about Assyria, we'd go into the details. I'm going to show you a few. Okay. So a few things that have to do with our history, really interesting, is this stella. This stella, which means uh, a victory uh, shrine, a victory stone, uh, which was erected by a king known as Shalmaneser III. Uh, 
It has a lot of writing inside it. This is the Assyrian language in cuneiform, which was the cuneiform pretty much Akkadian. It's an Assyrian Akkadian, but Akkadian was the international, uh, it was the lingua franca, the uh, diplomatic language. It depicts King Shalmaneser with the images of the different deities on top. So there's a sun god, lightning bolt, moon god, this little hat, who knows what, you know, different gods. And the story that it's talking about is a battle which shows up in the Book of Kings. Uh, it's called the Battle of Karkar. We're talking about 853 before the Common Era, so 2,850 years ago. It's before Assyria became an empire, but it deals with a coalition in which, in which King, I almost said Captain Ahab because of Moby Dick, King Ahab, <laughs> that is King Ahab of Israel, was part of a coalition fighting against Assyria and it lists him as having 20,000 chariots, which is a, a very large number of chariots, a testament to the strength of the Northern Kingdom of Israel and the 10 tribes. So this is just an example. It's called the Kirk monolith. Uh, also have a few other ones. That's the gift shop, pay no attention. Don't spend your money quite yet. Um, here we go. So what we have here on the left, we have one of those striding wing in this case, lion and not bull. You see the feet, kind of like the ones behind me from the Met. Uh, so they were also from the same area, more or less one of the Assyrian palaces. We're going to go into the palace in a moment, but these two, they're called Lamassu. These two Lamassu were there as a protection, uh, divine protection on your way in to see the king. That's kind of cool. Um, as are these other winged creatures, these genies, which are also magical protection to the king and the inhabitants of the palace. That's kind of what the idea is. So on the other side, there's a lion. Also, entrance to a palace, imposing, powerful, scary, really large. I stood underneath it. I didn't reach the chin. Um, it's pretty tall. And you have to remember that these things were colorful before, you know, everything got covered in ruin and it was, uh, and it faded. This thing was colorful. As I mentioned, we're, we're going to visit the Met in a couple of weeks and we'll see the Greek and Roman statues in color, but the Assyrian statues were also in color. Now, this uh, very plain looking black obelisk is called quite creatively the black obelisk. And to its left, you can guess the white obelisk. Um, the black obelisk is a story of battle campaigns of, again, Shalmaneser III. And it's sort of one of those missing pieces of a broader story that in the Book of Kings, we only hear parts of. But what I want to focus in, just to show you right here, if you look really carefully, I'm going to circle him so you see him. Um, on the floor is a, is a figure who is bowing down, he's kneeling, and he's kissing the feet of the king who's standing up here. And on top of the king is this winged sun disk, which symbolizes Ashur, the god of Assyria. This is a picture, and it says it in writing on top, so it has an identification. His name is King Yehu of Israel in Samaria. He is a usurper to the throne. He is in the time of Elijah the prophet. It's a later story, but the story shows up. But this story does not show up in the Book of Kings. It's sort of like one of those, it helps us understand the bigger picture in terms of the geopolitical situation but it's not important for the author of, of uh, the Book of Kings to tell us all these stories because there's lots of stories going on all the time. But it's really a cool story. And here we see that King Yehu is bowing down and kissing the feet of Shalmaneser, accepting his rulership. So this is just in a nutshell, two examples of our interaction with the Assyrian Empire. And there's much more. Uh, before we go to our final stop, I'd like us to see a few things about Assyria. So let's approach the palace gates. These are the gates of Balawat, as the modern name of the city in is, but it's from one of the palaces. If you look up close, you see that it's the wood is obviously redone. Here are some other gates as well from the palaces. But the original bronze, which decorated it, is full of tiny, tiny scenes. Look at that. There's, there's all these fun things going on. There's, there's so much action here. It's really cool. There's characters doing things. There's offerings of some sort. There's animals being led. There's training horses. There's battle. I mean, there's a lot going on here. It's really entertaining. Here's uh, people on boats. Now, this is typical Assyrian. Right? We're going to see it in a moment in larger scale. But now look up. 
very imposing doors, right? What you don't see here is what you would see if you'd be walking in at the time that this palace was in operation some 2,800 years ago, when the, the, the flayed skin of the king who didn't pay his taxes and thought of rebelling against Assyria, his skin was hanging above the door as a deterrent against anyone who would dare to even consider not paying your taxes on time. So uh, yeah, fun stuff. Uh, the Assyrians are rated the, the most cruel empire in the ancient world. And that's saying something, because in the ancient world, in order to even ha fight, everything was hand-to-hand. -hand. You were fighting somebody with a sword. You didn't have the luxury of sniping from a mile away. You had to be up in their face and deal with all the post-drama. I mean, I don't, don't even want to get into thinking about that right now. But you have to imagine that people naturally had to be tougher just to deal with life, not to mention battle. So even then, the Assyrians were considered really, really cruel. Um, so we're in the corridors of the palace of Tiglath-Pileser, who is the one who elevated Assyria from kingdom to empire. And this is a picture of the king, looking uh, very uh, pious, doing something ritual with these winged creatures protecting him. This is the king. And the way you identify the king is with what he's wearing on his head. Uh, so this is the royal crown. That's the giveaway. So if you know to look for that, that's the giveaway. And these are the different deities of Assyria as a necklace, sort of as protection. Uh, we saw this earlier, but this is, again, this is typical uh, in Assyrian uh, royal art. And... I had to imagine this was really colorful. And then what it says there in writing, for those who know how to read and bother to read about it, usually has nothing to do with the pictures, which is kind of like, uh, you know, uh, magazines when you're waiting at the doctor's office back in the day when that was a thing, where, you know, you're just looking at it for the pictures. What it says doesn't really matter that much, right? So it says one thing, which has to do with the inauguration of the palace and the guests who came and the gifts they brought and the wealth of the this and the that and how many Maseratis he has and how many Rolls Royces he has. Nothing to do with the picture. The picture is there for people who can't read, and it's also impressive. Now, let's take a look at other things that they show on the walls. There's, there's a lot to see. What I want to point out is the king in battle. And look what the king is doing. Look carefully. The king isn't really in battle. The king is hunting lions. He is hunting lions for sport in an arena. The Assyrian kings were very famous for hunting lions to portray their strength. Other kings did the same. There's also uh, Egyptian kings which hunted lions, but the Assyrians turned it into a sport, which is different. So this is the king... Uh, holding a libation bowl. There's people waiting on him. He's holding his bow, and below him is a defeated lion. The king of Assyria showed his glory by fighting and battling lions. Very ferocious. Another thing that the Assyrians did, which they, which they did for to glorify themselves and, and Assyria, is raise many, rage many campaigns, wage, that is, many camp, battle campaigns, and then they would show the pictures of the campaigns on their palace walls. Ladies and gentlemen, you are looking at an ancient tank. This is the tank designed by Assyria to crumble the fortifications of a wall while the besieged people are shooting their arrows and all they've got at this tank. And the Assyrians are covering their advance with arrows as well. So showing the king in battle is a key part. This is the king. Remember, here's the hat. That's the giveaway. Everyone else is wearing a pointy helmet, and the eunuchs are just there with their hair. Um, this is the king in battle in the forefront. Doesn't mean he actually did that, but that's what they show in the pictures, right? Um, furthermore, some really cool things that you see. Uh, imagine just crossing the Tigris River. It's, a, it's known as the Raging Torrent. It's a very, very difficult, torrentious river to cross. The Assyrians not only crossed it many times, they had scuba divers, expert warriors who would go ahead of the ships in inflated goat skins, as you can see in the picture, and they'd basically be the infantry in the front lines clearing the path for everybody to land. This, by the way, is how the Assyrians invaded Egypt. Nobody's ever done it before. The Assyrians were the first to invade and control Egypt 
which is really a fascinating story, which has to do with King Hezekiah. Uh, it's a great story, which I'd love to get into at some point, not today, but here we are. So we're watching an Assyrian, uh, we're, the Assyrian Marines. I mean, this is really cool. And there's a lot more to talk about in terms of Assyrian battle tactics and psychological warfare. There's a lot more to talk about, but we sort of got the sense of Assyria as a powerful military uh, con conquering empire in the ancient Near East. And with that, I'm going to wrap up Assyria for today. I'd like us to go now and talk about our final stop, which is Babylon. So now, uh, onto your seatbelts, I'm giving you a heads up. We're about to make a jump. We're going to go quickly to Iraq and then to another surprise museum in, in Europe who excavated in Iraq. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, by the rivers of Babylon, where we sat and we weeped and spoke of the destruction of Jerusalem. This is Iraq. We are in the south of, Mes south of Mesopotamia. This is the Euphrates, Ri Euphrates River, which is much narrower than it was before the building of the dam. Things change also in terms of you know, the water flow. These are the excavated ruins of the city of Babylon. Not far from here is a replica of the Palace of Babylon built by Saddam Hussein. Uh, not going there today, but uh, you are looking, uh, we're looking north, and that's important because this uh, part over here, um, I'm going to jump in so you see it better. These are the ruins of Babylon. That's what's left today of the seventh wonder of the ancient world, the hanging gardens of Babylon. This is what's left of it. I wouldn't say that's all that's left of it. This is what's left of it after uh, all the Western countries came and looted whatever they could and left it. But this is the, this is the ruins of Babylon. And um, they've, of course, reconstructed it to give you a sense of part of its former glory. But after England and France and uh, I'm not sure if the United States, uh, but definitely Turkey, um, they came and took what they could. They said to the Germans, whatever's left you can take, it's all rubble. Well, the Germans actually discovered a treasure here, which took many, many years to reconstruct. And that is the fragmented, colorful glazed bricks of the gate of the city of Babylon. Now, the reason I'm mentioning the gate is because I'm going to take a look one more time. If we are coming in from the north, looking south, this right here, this is the procession way, which had the lions on both sides, which leads into what was an ancient gate right over here, which leads into the city itself. If you are conquered Judeans as our ancestors were on their way into exile, this is the way you're coming in because you're coming in from the north along the Euphrates River and you're marching and being marched, humiliated, paraded into Babylon, coming through these gates into your new home. So I want to take us to those gates to see what they look like. These gates were excavated by a German expedition and thus are in the Pergamon Museum in Berlin. Last jump for today in three, two, one. Welcome or welcome to Berlin. In the Pergamon Museum, there are some fascinating biblical treasures, but I'm going to mention, since we're going to plug this into our next upcoming tour, both in the museum and virtually, here is another copy variation on the theme of the Acropolis of the Parthenon. This is the impact of Greece on the West. I had to mention that. Now, um, I'll mention one more thing about Germany. Right across the street here is the new museum where you have uh, Queen Nefertiti, so uh, the, the wife of Akhenaten. Uh, it's the Germans who excavated in the capital, Akhetaten, known as Amarna. So that's, that's a great story for another time. Let's jump in to our final stop. So 
welcome. This is a very uh, beautiful uh, procession way, with which originally had 120 lions, striding lions, leading all, leading, uh, sort of accompanying you as you make your way towards the gate. We're going to go to the gate, but I first want to show you this incredible work. Uh, you'll notice that there are modern bricks on the top that were reconstructed based on fragments. So it's the same design, like we know more or less what's missing, but the missing parts uh, are the majority. Um, I think it's like 85% reconstructed, which is incredible. Most of it was found in rubble and ruin and was painstakingly over many years reconstructed to the state that it is now. So this is, the, this is really uh, a testament to the German work ethic and like, they really saw something that nobody else saw. Um, and it's incredible, you know, it's here in Berlin. Several of them are on loan, on permanent loan, I guess, in different museums around the world. So like I mentioned, there's one in Canada from the throne room, not from the procession way. There are two at the Metropolitan Museum of Art. Uh, there's one in the Rhode Island School of Design, one in the Boston Museum of Fine Arts, and there's one in, in Copenhagen, et cetera, et cetera. There, there are several of them around the world, but this is where they belong. Now, this is a model of Babylon. We, we just, um, excuse my jump, I jumped to Turkey. I didn't mean to jump that far. Uh, here we go. I just wanted us to see the model, but oh well, whatever. It's, uh, it's being a little bit playing hard to get, but th this is a model showing us the gate and the procession way. We are now going to follow in the footsteps of our ancestors as they were paraded into Babylon, into the exile of Babylon. So let's move ahead and look up at the gate. Um, this gate was one of the uh, contestants for the seven wonders of the ancient world. It was built by King Nebuchadnezzar himself. And we know that because of the following inscription. I'm gonna show it to you on the side. Here it is. Um, sorry, jumped a little too far. One second. This happens sometimes. You get a glitch and you sort of walk through the wall. Uh, this inscription on the side is written in cuneiform. And this entire inscription is King Nebuchadnezzar himself talking about how he built the city of Babylon with a with a gate that goes to the heavens and goes all the way down to the deep, connecting heaven and earth, which in ancient Babylonian uh, mythology means a lot because they believe that Babylon was created from the remnants of uh, Apsu, Tiamat, you know, the dragons of chaos and all that fun stuff. Um, so he shows the gods of, uh, of Babylon here on the wall. So look, there's dragons. The dragons represent the god of Babylon known as Marduk, who's also a major part of Babylonian creation myth myth myths. But below him is the bull, and the bull is Baal or, or Hadad. It depends, you know, what culture you're in. It's the, the storm god. So you think of, you know, the, the raging bull uh, the, with, the, with the steam coming out of his nose, rumbling like the thunder. The bull is the thunder god in many stories, not only in Babylonian, but also in Canaanite, also in in um, in Damascus and Aramean, also in uh, in Zeus in Greece is also connected to the bull in different ways, but not exclusively. is a little more uh, creative in terms of the animals he turns into in order to capture other other men and women, as you know. Um, and the other part here, which is really cool, is this stone. I'm wondering if any of you recognize what this is. It's a very, very famous stella. It's much earlier than Abraham, uh, sorry, than the Nebuchadnezzar. It's from around the time of the Exodus, uh, roughly the year 1400 BCE, so 3,400 years ago. This is the Hammurabi stella, or rather it's a copy. The original is in the Louvre in France. Uh, this is a copy, but the reason it's here is because Hammurabi was the king of Babylon the king of Kassite Babylon. Um, so that's why it's here. He's important uh, in the context of the history of Babylon. And there's a lot more here. It's a beautiful gate. Now, I'd like to end with the following discussion. I don't know why we jumped. That was weird, but okay, fine. Um, we talk about the, uh, the proud kingdom of Judah 
as represented by the lion. In fact, if you come to Jerusalem, you'll see that even the sewage covers, lids, have a lion on them because the lion is the emblem of the tribe of Judah, which is where Jerusalem is located. So the lion is the symbol of Jerusalem. And if you think about just symbolically the, the psychological impact of a nation, a proud nation uh, from Judea, uh, the capital of the kingdom of Judah, Jerusalem, who think of themselves as the lion of Judah being subjugated by a nation that celebrates lions. They also have their own connection. It's the goddess Ishtar, the goddess of war, um, kind of like Athena. And we are paraded going into our new home, our captivity, with lions everywhere, that has a psychological impact. Like that's really, really powerful. And that's why there's a beautiful 16th century song that's it's my favorite uh, Shabbat song, usually sung on a Friday night. It's Kari Bon Olam, the Olmaya, Antu Malka Melech Malchaya. It's paraphrasing words from the book of Daniel, praise said in Aramaic about Nebuchadnezzar, but sort of switching it around to be praised for God. But the entire song is a song which refers to the experience of Jews in, in, in exile. It's paraphrasing verses from the book of Daniel, which is in Babylon, and it's in Aramaic for that reason. And a key uh, phrase in one of the stanzas is, Save your sheep from the mouth of the lion, as a prayer. And redeem your nation from... The, from exile. The comparison between exile to the mouth of the lion, I'm guessing, comes from this formative experience for the first time where the kingdom of Judah, our ancestors, were conquered and brought into exile, which is seen also in the visions of Daniel. There's a comparison between Babylon and the lion. But the point is, you see that when we encounter these lions, we're, we're, we're brought in, what we are seeing is our captivity and a shift in our understanding of our you know, being in control. We are now truly in exile. So the Babylonian exile on the rivers of Babylon, on the Euphrates River, is, uh, is where we really come to grips with we are now really in exile. So the formative exile experience is the lion, which is Babylon, which is really cool. So that was an overview of uh, Mesopotamia, and I hope that it's given us uh, I hope this was clear and, and, and concise a lot more than, you know, last week is a little bit all over the place. I hope this really gave us a framework for understanding Mesopotamia, the importance of its location, and a few key cities and cultures in it which intersect with our, uh, with our identity. So thank you so much for joining me on this uh, amazing tour around the world. And I'm now going to turn the floor to you for uh, questions. really unmute anybody. So that's, I'm going to leave that to Rabbi Fishman to uh, monitor. That was, that was absolutely incredible. I never thought I would see, thank you so much. That was amazing. I never thought I would see scuba divers in the Assyrian army going into the water and you said they were wearing this animal skins or something, and there was a tank. They, they, they had. They were. Running. They were. They were hugging inflated gold uh, goat skins so that they can float. Wow, so they, that was that blew my mind. And that there should be a tank in the ancient world uh, knocking down the walls. That was incredible, and just the color, the richness of the blue colors, and. Uh, it was it was fantastic. What a wonderful tour. Thank you so much, Nachliel. That was brilliant. I really enjoyed that. Learned a ton, and I hope that everybody else did as well. Are there any questions that you can either write in the chat or that you would like to put your hand up if you're familiar with the reactions button? You can raise your hand if you've become an expert now at the bottom of the Zoom screen of, of tab called reactions susan Berger would like to ask um, i'm getting back to the passageway you, susan oh right yes oh i think there's a bit of a delay with someone that's what was sort of I yeah okay I'm listening. My, oh. 
Where did you go, Susan? I uh, I don't see your screen. Oh, there you go. Let's okay. try that again. Yes, I unmuted you. Susan, please go oh, ahead. Thank you. Um, the gates that you, we just saw and the passageway, I, I presume that's painted. Would the, Is that the, paint? The lions? Yeah. Well, the no, passageway it's not, it's not and the gate. It's not paint. No, it's glazed bricks. It's faience. It's glazed brick. Okay. That's what I wanted to know. I didn't know they had that capability. I thought maybe well, ceramic. Was... Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yes. It's uh, There was an exhibition a few years ago, I think three years ago, in uh, across the street from the Met. It's it's in it's um it's an NYU institution. It's called ISA, the Institute for the Study of the Ancient World, and they had a special exhibit specifically about the making of the Ishtar Gate, showing that it really took international level cross cultural engineering in order to make this thing. It was a marvel of the ancient world in terms of the materials necessary, the skills necessary. Yeah. Blue is a very rare color, to, difficult color to work with and create. And that was really why it's one of the, it was a, a contender for the seven wonders of the ancient world. And then there was copper enameling. Yeah, yeah, yes, but that is, that, okay, glazing. Thank you. Okay, there's another question in the chat, and that is, were these wall monuments and statues originals taken from the palaces, or were they copies? Um, they are original. They're all original. In a few cases, I pointed out, like the Hammurabi Stella, I mentioned that's a copy. The Oriental Institute of Chicago also has it. It's just very famous. So there's certain artifacts that were made. They made casts of them, but most of what you're seeing was excavated by the, the universities that are represented by these museums. And what usually happened is under the Ottoman Turkish Empire, they had this agreement called Partraj, where we come and invest the time and money and resources to excavate a site. And in return, we get to keep half of it, even though the, the native country gets first dibs. That's mostly how it was done. Obviously, it wasn't not everything was as clean, but that's most of what we're talking about. So it's original. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you. This is Nachliel Salavan. He's known as the museum guy. If you Google him, you will find all of his credentials, his name, his details. He is coming to us live from Israel with the wonders of Zoom and technology, Baruch Hashem. And as we close today's presentation, this is a great opportunity for me to push for one final time. If you've enjoyed Nachliel's presentations, please know that in two weeks time from today, the Shah is offering a trip to New York City with Nachliel in person. We're going to be spending Sunday evening, all of Monday and Tuesday morning in New York with your Shah friends. Nachliel is going to be taking us on a full day private tour of the Met Museum. This promises to be a wonderful opportunity. We do need extra people to sign up because we're a small group right now and we have to justify a synagogue trip to New York. So we are still looking for more people to sign up. If you would like to sign up, the details have been sent in the email that you received this afternoon, reminding you about today's class. And if anyone has any questions, you can reach out to me privately. It would be my pleasure to talk to you, to answer questions and to give you more information. We're only a few more people away from being able to go get to the tipping point so that we can make this trip a reality. But we do need a few more people. So if you're interested in spending December 4th to 6th in New York with myself and Nachli Al Sullivan in person, a full day private touring at the Met, Jewish cuisine, shopping, <laughs> leading rabbis and everything else that this trip is promising, please sign up, please get in touch with me. It would be our pleasure to continue our learning in person. I'd like to take this opportunity to thank all of you for being on this very special presentation today. Thank you so much, Nachliel. And we look forward to seeing you next Monday at noon for Nachliel's third of three online presentations virtually. And I'll remind you that tomorrow at 12 noon, I continue my class on truth and falsehood 
the series titled The Content of Our Character. Thank you, everybody, and have a great week, a great day, and we will see you all again soon.